Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? I'm the whistler. If you could look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize he's inanimate, dead, with no power to harm. That was old Peter Medford, the jungle explorer, now confined to a wheelchair with paralysis. I would suggest that you leave this place at once, Miss Medford. At once. That was Clay Alden, Peter Medford's secretary. And this is Marie, Peter Medford's young niece. No, no, no. It's no dream. It's here. Here in my room. Saturday night, and CBS presents another in the new mystery series, The Whistler. And I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you tonight the strange mystery of the shrunken head. In the quickening darkness of a stormy fall evening, a young girl paces the deserted platform of a small suburban railroad station. From her anxious attitude, we know that she's waiting for someone. But just be patient, Miss Medford. There is someone coming to meet you. <laughs> He has just now driven up. He is coming through the station door, walking up behind you. Miss Medford? Oh, oh yes, I... Sorry to have kept you waiting. I'm Clay Alden. Oh, yes. Uncle Peter has mentioned you in his letters. Uh, his secretary, aren't you? That's right. Where is my uncle? He was disappointed he couldn't meet you. Pretty much of a task for the old gentleman to get around these days. You see, he's confined to a wheelchair. Oh, I didn't know. Serious? Legs are paralyzed. Result of jungle fever. Just came on him lately. How awful. Yes, it's a shame, all right. Well, shall we get going? Car's out front. Better run for it or you'll get wet. Yes. I'll take care of your luggage. Thank you very much. Rather a disappointing reception, Marie Medford, wouldn't you think? You have come over 2,000 miles all by yourself just to see the only living relative you have in the world. And then you are met by a stranger. The car turns up the tree-lined driveway. This Marie is what is known in this countryside as Medford Manor. Yes, Medford Manor. It's all that the name implies, a gloomy pile of a structure, even made gloomier by the blackness of the night and the driving rain. Oh, someone has heard the car approach. The door is open. It's the butler, Victor. Well, Marie, are you going in? <laughs> what a pity you don't know what I do. You'd never cross that threshold if you did. Hmm, too late now. Your luggage is being brought in. The young man and the butler stand beside you. The door closes. Victor? Yes? Take Miss Medford's luggage upstairs to the south corner bedroom. The, the, the south corner bedroom, sir? Certainly. Why not? Very good, sir. Um, any further instructions? No. Oh, uh, has Mr. Medford retired yet? Uh, not yet, sir. He's in his study. I I just gave him his his warm milk. He may have dozed off, sir. All right. Thank you, Victor. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Would you care to follow Victor to your room, Miss Medford? I'd like to see my uncle now, if I could, please. Very well. Come this way. Here we are. I'll speak to him. Wait here, please. Well, Marie, how do you like it? You get a feeling of something not as it should be? <laughs> Strange fellow, this Clay. And the butler, too. Uh, look about you. What a depressing house. 
huge and cold and unfriendly. Oh, not at all as you'd imagined it. <laughs> Is it, Marie? Your uncle will see you now. Thank you. Marie, my dear child, come in, come in, come in. Uncle. Well, well, my oh. poor child, take off those wet things at once. Holden, what's the matter with you? My niece will catch her death. Help her off with those things. Sorry, Mr. Medford. Thank you. Bless my soul, pretty as the picture. You got a kiss for us? Of course. <laughs> That's it. Now you sit down here beside me. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you, my dear, but I, I'm afraid the ravages of old age and malaria have finally caught up with me. My one comfort is this wheelchair. <laughs> Getting onto it, though, you should see me wheeling all over the house. <laughs> the only thing that baffles me is the stairs. My life is now confined to the first floor only. Oh, pretty bad trip, wasn't it? Seemed endless. Well, you're here now, thank goodness. This is your home. You're free to come and go and do whatever you please. Thank you, Uncle Peter. Don't suppose any of this is what you imagined? I know that I'm different from what I'd hoped you'd find. <laughs> Tell me, Uncle Peter, do you think you'd have recognized me if you hadn't known I was coming? Recognize you? Why, of course. You have the family of Medford written all over you. Oh. No mistaking you, my dear. Well, Alden, what are you standing there for? What are you staring at? Oh. Waiting to see if you need anything for this. Uh... No, 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 that's all. I'll ring for you if I need you. Yes, sir. Oh, I forgot to thank him. For what? He gets paid for whatever he does? Forgive me for saying this, but somehow I don't like that young man. Was he rude to you? Oh, no, not actually. But he seems to resent my being here. And the butler, he seems resentful, too. I feel as though I don't belong. Oh, they're harmless enough. But getting back to you... I I was so sorry I was in South America at the time the time it happened. Must have been pretty ghastly for you, my child. Like a nightmare, Uncle Peter. I'm not myself yet. I should think not. An only child losing both parents so suddenly and and so horribly. Maybe it was a good thing it was sudden. It had to happen at all. One spectator at the crash said that they never never knew what happened. Now, 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 you mustn't talk about it. All that's behind you, a new life from now on, hmm? Of course. And that's the way I want to look at it, Uncle Peter. And I'd like to get something to do. What? Oh, no. Oh, yes, you... really, I would. I want to be active if I can. I'm quite capable. I'd really like to get a, a job, Uncle Peter. Well, bless my soul. Secretarial work or anything. Well, that, that might not be a bad idea. It'll keep you from brooding. We'll see what we can do. And now, now I have a little surprise for you. You haven't seen my collection. No, I haven't. Mother and father often talked about it. Well, if you'll just open that door over there, I'll show some of it to you. Oh, this one? That's right. Uh, you'll find the light switch just inside. Why? Why, it's a regular museum. All these glass cases. Over here, my dear. Now, look at these. Well, what do you think of them? Why, well, they're horrible, Uncle Peter. They look like, like tiny human heads. Well, that's exactly what they are. Life-size at one time, but isn't it remarkable the way they shrink them down? Look at this one. See his little features, perfect in every detail. He's my favorite. Interesting history about him. He was once a white man. Oh. Forced down in a South American jungle when his plane cracked up. The headhunters got hold of him, and there he is. His name is Charlie. I'd like to see him closer. I can unlock the case. No, no, please. Do you mind if I don't look anymore? Oh, dear. I, I keep forgetting people are sometimes shocked by these things. I see them only through a collector's eyes. Oh, well, you'll have lots of time to look over my jungle paraphernalia. Meanwhile, perhaps you'd better get some rest. Would you like Victor to get you something to eat? No, thank you, Uncle Peter. But I am rather tired. I, I think I'll say good night to you. Know your way about, do you? Yes, I'll, I'll find my room. Good night, Uncle Peter. Good night, my sweet child. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Poor Marie. Know something? You're going to have dreams tonight. Unpleasant ones, too. <laughs> Well, let's move the clock ahead and go to Marie's bedroom. 
It's a little after three in the morning. She's asleep now. The rain's still coming down. The wind moans outside. Hear it? Yes, Marie's asleep. Looks peaceful enough lying there in that big four-poster bed. But suddenly she begins to toss. Mm. My name's Charlie. Mm. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. Only a dream. And it seems so real. I'm sure I heard it whisper. My name's Charlie. Only the wind. Oh, I wish I hadn't seen that dreadful thing. Miss Medford, are you all right? Who's there? Clay Alden. Oh. Oh, yes, Mr. Alden. I, uh... I just had a bad dream, that's all. I'm quite all right, thank you. Well, if you need anything, just ring. Yes, I will. Sorry I disturbed you. Not at all. Oh, I, I must get some sleep. Stop dreaming. But little sleep for you, Marie. <laughs> the moments tick by with dreadful slowness. Fearing to close her eyes, she lies staring at the roof of her bed. Lying in agony for the moment when that hideous little head will again come floating in through space. <laughs> it is morning now. A dreary fog still hovers depressingly over the old house. A cold clamminess which only adds to Marie's sensation of uneasiness. In the dismal morning room, Victor is serving breakfast to Clay Alden and Marie. Shame you didn't rest well last night, Miss Medford. Oh, it's just the newness of everything. I'll get used to it, Victor. I hope you will, Miss. Of course you will. Oh, and Mr. Alden, um, don't mention anything to my uncle about that silly dream I had last night. Oh, of course not. Did you have a bad night, miss? Yes. The daytime makes such a difference in things. Even you seem different, Mr. Alden. For the better, I trust. Oh, sorry. That wasn't very complimentary. Oh, here comes Uncle. Well, good morning, you two. Good morning, Mr. Medford. Morning, Uncle Peter. You look quite fit this morning, sir. Feeling splendidly. Had the best night's sleep and I don't know how long. And how are you feeling, my child? Quite well, thank you, Uncle. Oh, uh, you remember our conversation of last evening? I mean, about you wanting to do something? Yes. I think I've got it for you. A friend of mine named Phineas Drake collects books, just purchased a library complete, wants someone to catalog it for him. Small pay, but not too difficult. Well, how does it sound to you? Oh, it sounds wonderful. It's just what I want. <laughs> Splendid. I'll call him again after breakfast. Can you imagine such an ambitious young girl, Alden? Wants to work, and she's only worth a cool million. Oh, not yet. I'm not, Uncle Peter. Well, whenever you become of age, or whatever it said in your father's will. I thought you knew what it said. I won't inherit my cool million until I'm married. What was that, Miss Medford? You see? Right away you put notions into his head. She said she won't come into her inheritance until she marries. Why her father made that strange provision, I shall never know. But, Marie, you stay your distance from this young man. Oh, Uncle Peter, you're making him embarrassed. <laughs> Can't an old man have his little joke? Anyway, with all the eligible young men you'll meet, poor Alden won't stand a chance. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Peter, please. <laughs> oh, all right, all right, all right. Victor, uh, where are my eggs? Right here, sir. Oh, yes, soft-boiled eggs. That's your diet. <sighs> Tell me, my dear. Did you find your room comfortable? Oh, yes, it's a lovely room. It's almost like a castle. Oh, I miss my old room, the one next to yours. I haven't been up there in over a month. One day soon, I'll have Victor and Alden carry me up those stairs just to see if the place looks the same. Victor, serve my niece some more coffee. Yes, yes, of course, sir. You're going to have something to do, eh? Well, you're an intelligent girl. Should do well at your new assignment. It's harder work than you thought, though. Hours of scanning small print and copying down the individual histories of countless books. All 
goes well for several weeks. And then early one afternoon, you return home, Marie, to find your uncle as usual in his study. Why are you so upset, Marie? <laughs> Marie! Well, you're home early. You're not finished already. Finished as far as Mr. Phineas Drake is concerned. I, I can't understand it. I've done my work well. This afternoon, Mr. Drake came to me and said he had no further use for my services. What? Didn't explain why, just, just looked at me queerly and said he preferred someone else to finish the job. Well, that's strange. Oh, well, he's an old crank. Don't let this upset you. We'll find something else for you to do. No, 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 no. Don't you worry. <laughs> with my work, Mr. Palanto. Surely it's been satisfactory. Well, you see, because of the uh, peculiar nature of my profession, I, I must have someone more experienced. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Medford. But I didn't, Professor Hanley. I did exactly as you instructed. What on earth is wrong? <clears throat> well, uh, you'll excuse me, Miss Medford, but uh, well, your ability as an assistant has not come up to standard. Please listen, Dr. Humphrey. I've studied botany, and I, I've checked this manuscript most carefully. There's not a single mistake. Very sorry, Miss Medford, but they're not all acceptable. Have to get someone else. understand it, Uncle Peter. Is there something wrong with me? Well, I, I shall certainly call Dr. Humphrey right away. Oh, no. No, I'd rather you didn't. But it was only the other day he telephoned me and said what an efficient secretary he thought you were. There's something wrong somewhere. Oh, uh, you, you know, Marie, I, I think I'd give up this idea of wanting to work. I haven't mentioned it to you, but you're really not looking your best lately. Well, to tell the truth, Uncle, I, I haven't been sleeping well. I have the most frightening nightmares. In fact, it's the same dream every night. Well, that's odd. What's the dream about? Well, I, uh, I keep seeing that little head. The one you said was called Charlie. Oh, dear. I, I suppose I made a mistake showing that to you on your first night. If you could only look upon Charlie as I do, you'd realize it is an animate dead with no power at all to do you harm. You build up a phobia about that head. Now, the thing to do is to destroy that fear by facing it. You come along with me, my dear. You mean in there again? It's the only way. Now, come along. Oh, no, Uncle Peter. I know what I'm doing. Open that door, Marie. I'm going to make you realize how foolish you've been. Over here, my dear. Oh, I know you think I'm being cruel, but I know my psychology. I... Why, that's strange. What is it, Uncle Peter? Why, somebody's broken into this case. Ring for Victor and get Alden here at once. Is something missing? Somebody has deliberately taken that head. <laughs> so Charlie is missing, eh? Wonder who could have broken the lock and lifted the little head from its black velvet pad. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> but now, several nights have passed. And still the head called Charlie has not reappeared. Marie has just taken a sedative her Uncle Peter gave her and is now lying on her bed, tossing, fretfully, praying for sleep. <laughs> sleep, Marie. Tonight? Oh, dear heaven. No dreams tonight. Let me get some sleep. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. My name's Charlie. No. Yes, Marie. No, you're no. holding me in your hands, Marie. Ah! Ah! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter! What's wrong, Miss Medford? Where's my uncle? She's downstairs asleep. Well, you're frightened out of your wits. Another of those dreams? It was no dream this time. The head. It's there in my room. What? It told me to open my eyes and look at it. And, and there it was in my hands. I, I threw it to the floor. Oh, I know dreams can seem terribly real, but... It was but... no dream, I tell you. It 
It's there now in my room. When I threw it on the floor, it, it rolled to the foot of my bed. Oh, don't look at me as though I'm a saint. Come look for yourself if you don't believe me. Just as you say. It's right here. I'll turn on this lamp, sir. Now, it... it's gone. It was here. It was. I saw it as plainly as I can see you. Oh, I know you think I'm crazy. Medford, please. What's wrong with Medford? I thought I heard you scream. Scream. It's your uncle. Are you all right? I'm coming down, Uncle Peter. I must talk to you. Now, 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 you must get hold of yourself, my dear. Oh, you won't think I'm crazy. But I really did see it. I touched it. And it was, was nestled like an, like an orange in my hand. I woke up and, and threw it on the floor. And when Mr. Alden and I came back to the room, it was gone. Oh, you don't believe I actually saw it. Do you? Now, now, now compose yourself, child. I want to ask you some questions. First of all, in this dream, do you hear a voice of any kind? Yes. Yes. A voice that whispers, my name's Charlie, over and over. But tonight it, it said something different. Now, it you said... needn't go on, my dear. I had hoped and prayed with all my heart that this wouldn't happen to you. But I'm afraid it has. What are you trying to tell me, Uncle Pete? You've heard me go on about the fine old Medford stock. Well, it so happens our branch isn't so fine. There's been something wrong with us. You mean... Insanity? Oh! But if there is insanity in the family, why haven't I heard of it before? Because, my dear, it's... It's the Medford secret. Oh. Oh, Peter. I'm frightened. Whatever you do, Marie, you must not let go of yourself. But but it's not easy being told you're mad. Uncle Peter, if I am afflicted, then then all those people must have known. That's why they discharged me. But how did they know? What did I do that would give evidence? Perhaps, perhaps you do things you're not aware of. Maybe I do. Seems the only logical answer. Oh, Uncle Pete. What's to become of me? Now, 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 we'll work this out together, my dear child. No one will ever know. You can depend upon me. I won't leave you. From tonight on, I shall be taken upstairs and I'll stay near you. Knowing that which afflicts us gives us a weapon with which to fight it. Just you rely upon me, my dear. Uncle Pete. Oh, Uncle Pete. I must see you for a moment. Very well. Better not close it. I'll have to talk quietly. Something wrong? Terribly wrong. The old gentleman's asleep in the next room. I had to wait till he dozed off before I could see you. Well? It's about the head. The head? The one he calls Charlie. It's back in its case. When did this happen? Sometime last night, I guess. After your nightmare. Yes, I'm convinced now that that's all it was. I am not so sure. What? When you threw Charlie to the floor, a piece of his ear broke off. I found it after you went downstairs. Here, here it is. It's Charlie's ear, all right? I checked it very carefully. Oh, no, this doesn't make sense. Did you ring for me, miss? No, no, Victor, no, I... I didn't ring. Oh, sorry, miss. Excuse me. Miss Lambert, you're in grave danger. You've got to leave this house as quickly as you can and never come back. What's going on in here? Uncle... What was that I heard you telling my niece, Clay? I said she should leave this house and never come back. All the impudence. Alden, explain yourself. I'll be glad to, sir. I think Miss Medford is in danger of losing her sanity as well as her life. What is all this poppycock? Are you trying to frighten my niece? Lord knows she's been through she's enough She's been without... through too much. If she weren't made of pretty stout stuff, she'd have been a gibbering idiot by this time. Alden, you're packing your things and leaving at once. Leaving? I'm afraid you're wrong, sir. I'm not leaving. Not yet. Maybe you're leaving. Now, Mr. Alden, what's the meaning of this? I'm sorry to break it to you this way, but I'm definitely convinced your uncle is a diabolical fiend. I can take so much and no more. Look here, Alden. If you know what's good for you, you'll leave here at once. At once, do you hear? You're pretty anxious to get rid of me, but it's too late. Miss Medford, you remember your father's will. You'd come into your money only if you married. Well, if you didn't marry, Uncle Peter would get the money. 
And if he could prove you were insane, you'd never be able to marry. You see how it all works out? Well, how dare you, Mr. Oldham? Listen Alden. to that maniac. Listen to me, Miss Medford. Your uncle, your loving uncle, was the one who telephoned your employers and told them you were crazy. Phineas Drake and all the others told me so today. I don't believe lies, it. Lies, lies, lies. Why, your uncle even told me you were crazy. I know what's happened. He himself smashed the lock and took the head from its case and planted it last night in your room. If you'll stand on a chair and look above your bed as I did this afternoon, you'll see a small radio loudspeaker. It's hooked up to a microphone in the back stairs hallway. The voice you heard was your Uncle Peter. I don't believe you. Last night, after you came out in the hallway, your Uncle Peter grabbed up the head, stepped out onto that balcony, and climbed down the vines to his study. Why, he's as mad as a March hare. How could I possibly be a party to such a monstrous plot? Why, I can't even walk. Look, look at this ear, a piece of Charlie's ear. I found it in Marie's room. That proves she wasn't dreaming, and it fits perfectly. I've tried it. Why, you... Give me that ear. Give it to me! Uncle Peter, you're walking. Give it to me! Look, look at him, Marie, standing unaided. Does that prove anything to you? Uncle Peter. Oh, and it's true. All right. All right, it's true. I can walk. But you are insane, Marie. Insane. You'll never marry anyone, Marie. I'll see to that. Victor, grab him. Don't move, Mr. Medford. Easy now. Don't believe what Alden says. You're crazy, Marie. There's no escaping it. You'll have those dreams, and Charlie will visit you every night. You'll hear him saying, My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. My name's Charlie. <laughs> Hold him, Victor. <laughs> Got him, sir. Oh, I think you're the one who's crazy, Medford. Maybe that could be proved. Take your hands off me. Take it easy now, Mr. Medford. Take it easy. There's nothing wrong with me. You know it. Is the car ready, Victor? Yes, it's ready. Come in, gentlemen. These are the officers. Yeah, then you'd better take him away. Yes, sir. Please come quietly, Mr. Medford. I'm not crazy. I'm not. Hello. You're lying on me. You're lying. Lying, you hear? You're lying. I... I'm terribly sorry about this, Marie. Terribly sorry. But it's all for the best. But how can it be for the best? What well, think what this means? He's my father's brother, and if he's insane, then, then it means that I might be too. Runs in the parents. No, no, don't worry, Marie. Don't worry. You're safe. You're perfectly normal. I know. You no. Know? Yes. You see, he wasn't your real uncle. He was your father's foster brother. I found proof. So you see, you've nothing, nothing in the world to fear. How do you know that? Someday, Marie, I'll tell you all about it. Tomorrow, maybe. Why don't you tell her now, Clay? Tell her why you were working as Peter Medford's secretary. Because your father was Peter's partner. His partner. That your father was ruined in business by Peter and killed himself. Killed himself in disgrace. That you suspected him of having cheated your father. That you came to find the evidence and discovered in time Peter's diabolical plan to prevent Marie from ever marrying. Better tell her, Clay. <laughs> I would. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Tonight's Whistler story was written by Joseph Kearns, directed by J. Donald Wilson, and originated from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, same time... I, the Whistler will return to tell you the strange story of the curse. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.